where we are getting ready for the baby. Not Nancy and me. No. You know, it's Christmas coming, right? Every year we turn our attention to the birth of Jesus. God uh, come into this world as a human. God in the flesh. God is a newborn. And I hope it never ceases to astonish you that God came into this world, Almighty God came into this world as an infant, as a baby. Because that's the heart of Christmas. We not only want to celebrate and honor and, and worship Him here, but we want to take Him home. Uh, we don't want to just leave Jesus here. We want the baby to make a difference in our homes and our lives. We want the child to influence us. You know, when you take a baby home, those of you who've had children, you know this. When you take a baby home, particularly that first one, your whole life gets turned upside down, doesn't it? Um, everything changes. Priorities are altered. Uh, you begin to live on a different time schedule. Uh, you spend your energy in totally different ways. Your life is not your own. Christmas, uh, or excuse me, children, children mess with your life. They just make you think about different things differently. How many of us became softer? We became more mature. We became a little deeper and had our total perspective on life changed when we had our first child. We want to take Jesus home this Advent and Christmas. Uh, by taking Jesus home, we mean we want him to be honored in our homes and in our school and in our work and in our lives and everywhere we go. When you walk out of this place, I hope you have Jesus in your mind, in your heart, in your whole being. We want him to mess up our neat little lives or maybe neaten up our messy lives uh, and put the the course of our life on a different direction. Luke is one of two gospel writers who give us the, an account of the birth of Christ. Matthew is the other. But Luke tells us the most. Now when we think of the Christmas story, what do we think of? Well, we think of Mary and Joseph and uh, the angels and the shepherds and the wise men. And in our Christmas plays, we even uh, think of the innkeeper. And he isn't even in the biblical story. Maybe you better read it for yourself. The, there is no innkeeper in the story. And we have Mary and Joseph, and we have the wise men, we have the shepherds, they're on our Christmas cards, there are ornaments on our tree. But you know, there's a lot more to the Christmas story than just them. I want us to hear over the next four weeks, five weeks, the full story. For, for one, as we heard this morning, there's the old priest Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, who were parents of John the Baptist, who was to be the forerunner to Christ. How come Zechariah and Elizabeth don't get any love at Christmas, huh? How come they're not on our Christmas cards or hanging from our tree? Uh, they have a place in the story. They have a huge place in the story. It's Zechariah and Elizabeth, really, who with their baby set up the coming of the baby. But first, they do have their own baby. And Luke says, I want to tell you about the birth of Christ, but first we need to start back with Zechariah and Elizabeth and what happened to Zechariah one day in the temple. Before we get to decrees of Caesar Augustus, uh, and before Mary and Joseph, and before shepherds have angels swirling around their heads, we need to start with the vision Zechariah had in the temple. 
Zechariah was a priest serving in the service of the Jewish temple. And 1,000 years before uh, Zechariah, during the time of King David, King David organized the descendants of Aaron. Aaron was the brother of Moses, the first priest. Uh, David organized all the priests into 24 different orders who were to serve at the temple in Jerusalem. The eighth order came from a person named Abijah. His name, that's that name in the reading we heard and saw this morning. And that was the order that Zechariah belonged to. Every order had to be in service to the temple twice a year for one week a year. Their job was to take care of the grounds. Their job was to uh, see to the worship areas being furnished, to perform the sacrifices and to lead prayers in the morning and every evening. It is estimated that there were between 18 and 20,000 priests in Jerusalem. It was a big, big thing. Since the time of Aaron, a priest would go into the temple, into this little room called the Holy Place. This room was separated from a room called the Holy of Holies, which is where the Ark of the Covenant rested. The Ark of the Covenant held the Ten Commandments of Moses. It held the rod of Aaron. And the priest would offer incense and he would pray for the people of Israel and for the coming of the Lord's anointed one, the Messiah. And the smell and the smoke of the incense would, would end up uh, symbolizing the prayers of the people going up to heaven to the Lord. And Zechariah had been chosen to do this, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord where he would go to the altar and, and offer the incense and pray for the people of Israel. It was done in the morning, it was done in the evening, and it was a high and special privilege to get to do this, to enter the holy place and pray on behalf of all of Israel. And on this occasion, Zechariah was chosen. We also get the impression that Zechariah had been praying to the Lord for he and Elizabeth to have a child. And as Zechariah is praying, it says, the angel of the Lord, Gabriel, shows up. A routine religious act done twice a day for century becomes a God-filled moment like had never happened before. And Gabriel tells Zechariah that he and Elizabeth are going to have a son. His name will be John. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. He'll turn people's hearts to the Lord. And he will be in the spirit and power of the great prophet Elijah. John's life call was to prepare the way for Jesus. And this is a big deal. And this is why. It says Zechariah and Elizabeth had no children because Elizabeth was barren and both were getting on in years. They were both old. Barren. Barren. That's a hard word. There's a, a coldness an emptiness, a pain to that word. Deserts are barren. Wastelands are barren. Barren places have nothing there. Every time we drive from Salt Lake City to where our family is in California, we go through Nevada and it is... When something is barren, it doesn't have any resources. It's unfruitful, it's desolate, unproductive, often harsh, sterile, stark. When it is applied to a person, that's harsh. And in these days, it was even, in, in the days of Zechariah and Elizabeth, it was even interpreted as something is wrong between you and God. Not being able to have children at that time, especially, especially if you were a priestly family, raised questions about your faithfulness to the Lord and your standing before God. Although Luke makes sure to tell us that Zechariah and Elizabeth were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commands and statutes of the Lord. But still, Elizabeth was barren. Even today, many men, uh, many women and couples long to have a child. They go through mental and physical and emotional and financial anguish. 
Zechariah and Elizabeth can't have children and we know it was painful and difficult for them because when Elizabeth eventually conceives, she says, the Lord has taken away my disgrace. Luke tells us, this is where Christmas begins, right here. They are barren and getting on in years. They have too little and it is too late. So why would God use them? I mean, why not, why not find a devout old couple who are fertile and who have some experience with kids and they're rich and abundant and no one questions why they don't have any children. In her book entitled Plan B, Further Thoughts on Faith, the writer and the Presbyterian Christian, Anne Lamott, says this, when God is going to do something wonderful, God always starts with a hardship. When God is going to do something amazing, God starts with an impossibility. Why does God with, start with a couple that's too old and too barren? Because he's going to do something wonderful and he's going to do something amazing. God is getting ready to enter this world. God is going to break into this world with something big. He is going to answer the prayers of the people that have been going up for centuries that he would come and deliver them. He is completing what he began with Abraham, what he continued with Moses, and what he promised to David. God is ready to move. And he starts out of a place of emptiness, out of a place of nothingness, impossibility, because he wants to demonstrate to the world that this isn't going to be a human thing. This is going to be a God thing. The Lord wants to show that he is the Lord who can do the impossible. That nothing is ever too barren for him. No place is too empty for him. No obstacle is too great for him. God does it to show his glory. God does it to show his majesty. God wants to show what he can do and who he is. And Luke makes a point of telling us that Elizabeth was barren to stress the human impossibility of what's going to happen. And God starts with barrenness because, you know, that's how he has always seemed to work. We've seen this childless couple barren thing before when God began to put his plan of putting things back together into, in, into process. He started with an old childless couple, Abraham and Sarah. And then uh, God blessed Rebecca and Rachel and Hannah who were also thought to be barren and couldn't have children. And when God uh, wanted a people for his own special possession, he started with a barren people who were slaves in a barren place place in Egypt when he wanted to show them his provision he led them through a barren place for 40 years and when people those people ignored him and weren't faithful to God they ended up in a barren exile place so that God could deliver them God told the prophet Jeremiah to go buy a barren piece of land in a place called Anatoth so that he could take that place that seemed hopeless and transform it into a place where Israel could have a future and a hope when Elijah, the great prophet, was tired and fried, lying in a desert, didn't think he had any more in him, God gave him strength to get up and serve him again. Is it any wonder then that the prophet Isaiah speaks these words about the Messiah to come when he says that the wilderness and the dry land is going to be glad and the desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon, and they shall see the glory of the Lord and the majesty of our God. God starts with barrenness to empty it of all human glory and show His glory. So that we won't say, hey, we did it. But they will say, God did it. God will start with an impossibility. You know what we say when, when something we think is impossible happens? What do we say? We say, we say no, no way. No way. Do you ever say that? 
when we hear something surprising, something we couldn't imagine, something that just seems beyond and way impossible. No way! No way! I have courtside seats to the Utah Jazz right behind the coach tonight. No way! We want an all-expense paid trip to Europe. No way! Did you hear that Phil picked up the check at dinner? No way! <laughs> this Christmas event is about God working in the no ways of life. Putting babies in the womb of two women who are too old and young girls who are too young and too new, but we'll get to marry eventually, won't we? The Lord uses people to work out his plan. He used Abraham and Sarah. He needed Moses. He found David. God chose Zechariah and Elizabeth, and he's going to use Mary and ask for her cooperation. But God wants to show that he's the one doing it because he chooses what is weak, the abandoned, the outsider, to show his glory. God chose the foolish and the weak things of the world. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are. That's for 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 28. Barren. There's nothing there. You know, if you're full, beware. Because you might miss God. But if you find yourself barren or empty, there just isn't anything there. God can do something. When God gets ready to do something amazing, he starts with an impossibility. If you find yourself in the no-way zone of life, if you feel like you have no resources, like God couldn't use you, God might be ready to work. You know, it's common to speak uh, of people who are addicts before they really... Uh, can enter that process of recovery, they, they have to hit rock bottom. They have to become barren of all the resources of their lives. And many times when someone finally hits bottom, it's then that God does a miracle in their lives. Or you can go 180 degrees to the experiences of someone who has it all and does it all, has done it all. He or she accomplishes great thing and they just walk right up the ladder and they get to the top where there's nothing more to accomplish and then they say... This is it. And they crash because they aren't any more fulfilled than when they started that climb. You can't be saved by God until you really realize how empty you are. I know I couldn't. I can pinpoint the time in my life when I realized, Phil, you're just empty. And you need Christ. <laughs> We all have to go through this process in one way or another to understand that we don't save ourselves. Our sin is too deep. Our wrong is too strong. And I think that's why sometimes God allows or sends crisis into our lives sometimes to reveal to us how weak and empty we can really be. He drives us to the end of ourselves. We are in, in need of something beyond and beyond ourselves. We need the intervention of God. We, we see our barrenness so that we can live in His fullness. And that is exactly what God does with Zechariah and Elizabeth. It's a God thing. The people waiting outside wonder why Zechariah is taking so long. And when Zechariah walks out of the temple unable to talk, the people who are outside praying and waiting are already beginning to understand that this is a God thing. They realize he's seen a vision. Something happened to Zechariah. And when Elizabeth becomes pregnant, she knows it's a God thing. Because if you read it, she doesn't say, look what we've done. She says, the Lord has done this for me. The Lord has done this for me. And that's where we want to be in life. We want to get to a place where we can say, the Lord 
has done this for me. I was barren, and the Lord brought, brought fruit. I was sick, and let me tell you, He healed me. I was confused, and He brought me to a place of guidance. I was empty, and He filled me. I was grieving, and He brought me through. I was in a, in a no-way place, and He did a no-way thing. And whatever that empty, hurting, barren spot is in your soul, God can do something there. Maybe it's like that because He wants you to fill it with Him. He wants you to give Him your heart. He wants to do a God thing in your life. He wants to bring the presence and the reality of His Son, that baby, Jesus to you and that happens simply by asking him to come and move into your life we seek him we walk with him we nurture that relationship once we've done that it's life transforming not always easy might make things harder to be honest with you but we'll know God and his fullness the reason for that child born to Zechariah and Elizabeth is not just for the sake of their own family but to make a people ready for the Lord. That's what John the Baptist was going to do. That's where it begins, getting a people prepared for the Lord. That's Advent. So, be awake. Who knows how he'll come to us. Zechariah just thought he was going in to do his priestly stuff. Who knows how and when might God, God might break in to your life and to my life. Let's pray. God, I ask your Holy Spirit to reveal your Son to those in this place who might feel barren. Do something in them. Bring them to life by giving them your life. Thank you that you are the God who has entered this world to show us who you are. Thank you that you've come in Jesus. And thank you that you dwell with the meek and the humble of heart. Do great things, O oh God. We open ourselves to you. Amen.